Let it be this way ever, dearest, by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. From the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Volume 1 of 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Caitlin Cooper. EBB to RB, Friday morning. Postmark January 31st, 1846. Let it be this way ever, dearest, if in the time of fine weather I am not ill. Then, not now, you shall decide, and your decision shall be duty and desire to me both. I will make no difficulties. Remember, in the meanwhile, that I have decided to let it be as you shall choose, shall choose. That I love you enough to give you up for your good is proof, to myself at least, that I love you enough for any other end. But you thought too much of me in the last letter. Do not mistake me. I believe and trust in all your words. Only you are generous unawares as other men are selfish. More I meant to say of this, but you moved me as usual yesterday into the sunshine. And then I am dazzled and cannot see clearly. Still I see that you love me and that I am bound to you. And what more need I see, you may ask? Well, I cannot help looking out to the future, to the blue ridges of the hills, to the chances of your being happy with me. Well, I am yours, as you see, and not yours to tease you. You shall decide everything when the time comes for doing anything. And from this to then, I do not, dearest, expect you to use the liberty of leaping out of the window, unless you are sure of the house being on fire. Nobody shall push you out of the window, least of all I. For Italy, you are right. We should be nearer the sun, as you say, and further from the world, as I think, out of hearing of the great storm of gossiping when Sirocco is loose. Even if you like to live altogether abroad, coming to England at intervals, it would be no sacrifice for me. And whether in Italy or England, we should have sufficient or more than sufficient means of living, without modifying by a line that good free life of yours which you reasonably praise which, if it had been necessary to modify, we must have parted, because I could not have borne to see you do it, though that you once offered it for my sake I never shall forget. Mr. Kenyon stayed half an hour, and asked, after you went, if you had been here long. I reproached him with what they had been doing at his club, the Anthem, and blackballing Douglas Gerald for one of something better to say, and he had not heard of it. There were more black than white balls, and Dickens was so enraged at the repulse of his friend that he gave in his own resignation like a privy counsellor. The really bad news is of poor Tennyson. I forgot to tell you. I forget everything. He is seriously ill with an internal complaint and confined to his bed, as George heard from a common friend, which does not prevent his writing a new poem. He has finished the second book of it and it is in blank verse on a fairy tale and called the university the university members being all females if george has not diluted the scheme of it with some law from the inner temple i don't know what to think it makes me open my eyes now isn't the world too old and fond of steam for blank verse poems and ever so many books to be written on the fairies i hope they may cure him for the best deed they can do he is not precisely in danger, understand, but the complaint may run into danger, so the account went. And you, how are you? Mind to tell me. May God bless you. Is Monday or Tuesday to be our day? If it were not for Mr. Kenyon, I should take courage and say Monday. But Tuesday and Saturday would do as well, would they not? Your own B.A. Shall I have a letter? End of letter. This recording is in the public domain.